Good morning, I'm Mark Kenlaw, president here at the college, and I want to, um, my task today is to welcome you here to the national celebration of first generation college students. A lot of students, in that, whether you're here today or whether you, we're recording this, you'll be able to see it online, but um, a lot of the students that we serve here at, at our college and really throughout our community college system and even nationally are first generation college students. And so this is a chance for us to hear from those that, uh, that were first generation college students and their successes, uh, their challenges that they had to uh, overcome to, uh, to get to where they are. Uh, so this is what this is all about. So I'm going to turn it over to the next person as we uh, begin to take a look at uh, first generation college students. You know, there's a lot of people in our country who are first generation college students that have done incredibly well. Uh, some famous people uh, uh, as far as that goes, but uh, looking forward to hearing some of the conversation today. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kinlaw. So good morning again, everybody. My name is Dr. Carolyn Salinger. I'm the Vice President for Student Development here at Rockingham Community College, and I want to welcome you all and thank you again for attending the First Generation College Student Celebration Day. We have a few events today, and this one is our, our first for today. We have uh, a panel of people right here at Rockingham Community College who are first generation in their family to go to college, finish their degrees, and uh, we're lucky to have them here because they are uh, really making some wonderful um, contributions to our college and, and um, encouraging other first generation students to finish. And so I just, I wanted to give a little bit of a definition of what is a first generation student because many of us in the room are first generation, but some of us probably are not first generation. And so there, you'll, when you look out there on the internet, there's a few different types of uh, definitions. But probably the most common is if, if neither of your parents went to college, you are considered a first generation. But one that I thought was um, a little bit more uh, broad, and it could be you as well, is those of us who did not grow up with a college-going tradition. So these are folks who um, did not grow up hearing about college on a regular basis, and so um, they are experiencing more, more challenges than those of us who maybe did grow up with a college-going environment. Uh, Senator Raphael Warnock of, of Georgia, you might be familiar with him, yeah, he is first generation and he talks about college education is really the gateway for a brighter life. So I really commend all of you who are first generation college students because you are the trailblazers in your family for a brighter future uh, for generations to come. So uh, Thank you for being here and for um, working hard. Because we know that our first generation college students are those who, who tend to be the more gritty and the more resilient students. So some of the, Dr. Kinlaw did mention some famous people who are first gen. Some of the others that I have listed, uh, Oprah Winfrey, she was first gen. Bill Clinton, Ben Carson, who is a, a neuroscientist, um, Michelle Obama, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Marcher, Margaret Thatcher. So you can see these are extremely uh, renowned people in uh, the world who started out as first generation college students, but obviously people in their, in their families have a, a, a brighter future because of the challenges that they took on. Uh, so this celebration event is part of uh, something that tr our TRIO program here on campus has uh, coordinated for us. And federal TRIO programs are really the primary national effort supporting underrepresented students in post-secondary education. 
and are designed to identify and support individuals in low income backgrounds. And many of those students who are from a low income background are first generation college students. And so um, we celebrate you today at Rockingham Community College. We understand the unique challenges that you are up against and we offer a lot of services and supports for you. One of the primary being the TRIO Student Support Services Program we have right here on our college campus. In fact, uh, we're in the ADT building right now and the TRIO Student Support Services is located right down the hall. Um, and I also wanted to say a, a quick plug because there was an email that came out yesterday from TRIO about grant aid that they have available. And so the grant aid is one of the best um, supports that they have for underrepresented and first generation students. So please read your email if you haven't uh, seen it yet and it'll give you steps on how you need to apply for the grant aid. And uh, so without further ado, I do want to get to our panel because that's why we're here. We have some wonderful people who have taken time out of their day to talk to us about their experience in college as first generation college students. So if you don't mind, I'd like for you each to self introduce yourselves. And Grace, if you wouldn't mind starting. Um, I am Grace Gross. I am the Admissions Processing Specialist and Continuing Education Advisor here. Um, and I'm also an RCC alumni. I'm Will Voris. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Aid and Veterans Affairs. Um, I'm Debbie Gray. I teach uh, biology, so I'm an adjunct faculty now. I'm retired from RCC. I am Margaret Peel. I am the Program Accountability Specialist for the credit side. I am also um, RCC alumni. Hi, I'm Vicki Chitwood. I'm the Dean of Health Sciences and Public Service Technologies. Okay, great. Could each of you also tell us your educational background and, um, you know, your, if you have a degree, obviously you have a degree, but what the degree is? Um, I have an Associates in Arts. I have an Associates in Science, a Bachelor of Arts, and three Master's, master's Degrees. Mm, I have an ADN, a BSN, Associate in Science, a Master's in Biology, a Master's in Education, a Graduate Level Teaching Certification, and a Certification for Microbiology. I have an um, Associate in Medical Office Administration, a Bachelor's Degree in Business Administration, and currently um, seeking or in the grad program um, for a Master's in Business Administration. I have an associate's in respiratory therapy. I have a bachelor's degree in career and technical education, and I have a master's degree in education. So it's safe to say that many of us are, are lifelong learners. <laughs> Start out as first gen, but are lifelong learners, so that's wonderful. Um, so my next question is, uh, I, you know, I was reading an article about first generation, and a lot of them talked about why they decided that they were going to be the first. So if, if you don't have that tradition in your family, what made you decide that you were going to be the first in your family? And let's start with Vicki this time. Um, the word college was never mentioned in my family as I grew up, so I am that broader definition. Uh, and I actually graduated high school and went to the factory, because that's what we did, and toured the factory and I thought, wow, I don't really know if I want to do this. So then I interviewed at the hospital and I got a job at the hospital at the early age of 17. And then I got to see what people did in the hospital. I got to see the nurses and the doctors and the respiratory therapists and at the age of 30, I decided I wanted to go back to school and be a respiratory therapist. And that's what got me to go, is I actually saw education in, progress, in, in action. Um, for me, um, college was mentioned, 
Um, but it wasn't necessary um, something that we foreseen because of the cost. Um, my immediate goal when I was um, in high school was to go into the military and I wanted to do accounting. Um, I became an early parent and got married early, so we traveled a bit, and um, so I never went into the military. My husband did, and um, I knew I should have been in school, but I was more focused on my family. My husband really um, kept saying to me I needed to go to school, and um, it wasn't that our family did not push college, or that I wanted to be the first. It's just I knew I needed more than what I had. And college was my way to get there because education is helped me to get a step forward. Thank you. Um, my family didn't talk about it either, but I didn't think about being a first generation college student till the email came out last week and I got to thinking about our family. I was like, oh, wow. So what made me want to go is I wanted to be a teacher. And to be a teacher, I had to take CP courses. In high school, my mom wanted me to be a secretary. So I ended up taking shorthand and typing, two years of typing. But I won. <laughs> I, I won in a way because I, I did get to go to college, but it took a lot. Uh, my grandpa was a truck driver, <clears throat> and so was my dad, and I really don't care for riding around and driving around that much. <laughs> and I really enjoy going to school, so I was like, if I don't want to be a truck driver, then uh, I should probably do something else, go to college and figure it out. Well. <clears throat> My, my answer is pretty simple. I wanted to be an example for my children. Um, I got laid off during COVID and I decided that I wanted a career um, and I wanted to prove to my kids that you can do whatever you set your mind to do. And I wanted to set an example to them that it was important for them to go to college and that if mama can do it, they can do it too. So I came to college. That's great. Um, and I think that for many of us, it, it took somebody that you saw or somebody in your family that really kind of pushed you and supported you along the way. So um, that's great. And just on a personal note, I am not a first generation college student, but I got to thinking about it and I, I asked my father, and my father is a first generation college student, so I asked him, you know, why did you go to college? And so his father was an auto mechanic, but his father really desperately wanted to go to college. And so he felt very committed to going to college because he wanted to do it for his father. But he ended up getting his bachelor's degree in chemistry and then his PhD in chemistry. So, you know, sometimes it's somebody in your family that really inspires you to go and get your education. So if for each of the panelists, if you could tell us a little bit about what was your greatest obstacle you had to overcome in reaching your goal. Will, do you want to start? Sure. Um, greatest obstacle for me was really trying to figure out where to start because no one I really knew went to college. I was, I'm from a smaller place than Rockingham County, so it was even more uncommon for people to go to college. So the access to that kind of information um, was hard to come by, and that was the greatest obstacle in figuring, figuring out how to go to college. Do you remember how you finally found the information? Um, it was after I joined the military, and they, they kind of exposed you to it and started learning from, from there. On There's college offices on base and stuff, and people would come around and talk about it. For me, um, I had a good guidance counselor in high school because the high school I went to is out in the county and like a lot of people didn't go to college. My dad worked in a mill. His dad drove a truck and my mom worked for Western Electric so I had a really good guidance counselor. She showed me, you know, you need to have these courses, you need to fill out these applications. 
And so that's all well and good. The, the big stumbling thing is how much it costs to go to college. So the college that was three miles down the road from the house was not affordable, but Appalachian was. It's a big, big difference. And you have to figure out where the money's gonna come from. That was a big obstacle. My biggest obstacle was myself, um, first of all, because I didn't think that I could do what I have done. I didn't think that I had enough time. I didn't think um, I had enough money. Um, I didn't want to, you know, have to deal with the financial issues that was going to affect our family if I stepped away and stopped work and stopped working and went to school. And um, then I had to figure out what was going on with my children and so on and so forth. So those obstacles were my barriers that I had um, just to try to figure it out because we were um, a young family and just trying to make it on a budget. So um, again, overcoming myself because I didn't think I was smart enough actually. That brings up a good point, the imposter syndrome that many first generation, or just college students in general maybe, feel like they don't, that they're not really going to be successful, they can't be successful, they don't belong here, that sort of thing. And that's a major challenge for first generation students. And so how did you stick with it, even though you felt like maybe you, you didn't have it in you? I had to, well, first of all, my husband was a, a constant and is a constant cheerleader for me. And then I had, when I actually started college when we, when I, when we were in Washington State, and I took a couple of classes, and um, later on I realized they were development classes. But I was like, oh, I did really well in that, because I wasn't very encouraged about you know, English, you know, my strong points was, were math and um, things like that. So, but once I took that, those classes, um, I ended up not finishing in Washington because I um, started my own daycare. But once we came back to the East Coast and I was able to um, apply college, I applied here. And I came and took the test, the, um, the to um, test for the co for college, and I was like, oh my God, I did horrible. And I didn't come back. It took me a year to come back. And then when I did come back, I took the test again. I saw a familiar face in the admissions department. And um, he encouraged me to, you got this, you, you could do this. And I was like, I don't know, because there were so many different things going on at home that I just wasn't sure, but I just had to push myself. And again, my husband pushed me, and then the encouragement from the um, person in admissions. Um, and so I just put, I just believed in, I believed in God and just went ahead and did to see what was the, what was gonna be the outcome. And if I could succeed in one class, then I would push myself to go to the next one. Wonderful. Vicki. Well, of course, I picked the field of respiratory therapy. That was what I saw that I liked. And the nearest college that offered that program was an hour and a half away from where I lived. Um, so money was a huge issue um, and travel. So five days a week, I got up and I drove to Roanoke, which was an hour and a half away to college to respiratory and did clinicals and stuff. Um, but my support was the hospital actually helped me and encouraged me and offered me a job while I was in school. I actually got to work in the respiratory department so I could work part-time while I was in school to help me financially. It was scary. It was, it was scary just to, to go like an hour and a half away every day, travel and to go to a, I lived in a little town, Bassett, and Roanoke was big to me at the age of 30. 
um, and getting around and finding your way to hospitals and things. It was scary. Yeah. So, um, but financially and the distance that I had to travel to, to accomplish my goal. There are so many things in life that are scary, but if you get through them and you don't ever give up, how much greater your life is now that you stuck to that? Yeah. And Grace. Yes. Um, listening to Margaret's story is very similar to mine. Um, dealing with, because I, I came back to school at 37. So I had family obligations, so trying to find classes that I could still take my kids to school and pick my kids up from school, um, that was a big obstacle to make sure that I could get the classes I needed at the times that I needed um, so I could take care of them as well. Um, also financially, um, I do have a family and I ended up not working at all so I could do full time um, for my education. So it was financially and working around my children's schedules. There was many a football games that I was studying my biology. <laughs> so it was during the game. If my son wasn't on the field, I was trying to study my biology. Um, so family obligations was my biggest obstacle and also financial kind of secondary a little bit. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sure you've received some advice along the way, but what would, what would stand out in your mind as one of the greatest pieces of advice that um, you wish somebody gave to you? You know, knowing now, what, what do you wish somebody would have told you back when you were making the decision to go and then trying to finish? Go ahead, um, Stay with it. Um, when I graduated high school, I came to RCC for one semester, and that was many years ago. Um, and it was hard, I just quit. Life happened, I could make more money, you know, working instead of going to school. Um, and so nobody really cared that I quit. Um, so my advice is to stick with it because it, it gets a lot harder the older that you get. So if, you, if you're in it and you see it through. That's a good piece of advice for sure. Well. Um, I would say that approach it like a marathon, not a sprint. It's not necessarily one way to get to the finish line. Um, getting it done like the traditional way is not always the way that everybody, that it works for everybody. Um, I, I was probably around 18 or so when I took my first college course and at 40 I'm still taking college courses. So it's, if I would have just approached it as I just have to get done as soon as possible, I probably would have quit a long time ago and not went as far. Good point. Cool. I would say don't sign up for so many hours. Don't overwhelm yourself because when I went to school in the 70s, um, I went to Appalachian two years. I didn't have an advisor. You just signed up for whatever. I ended up signing up for 18 to 21 hours a quarter. We weren't on semester system. It didn't take long to figure out. That's way too much to try to deal with. And it can make you um, really doubt, what are you doing here? But I'm hard-headed like my parents, so I just keep on moving. Other piece of advice in that experience too, if you find out that what you think you're majoring in is not the right goal, don't just quit. Don't, don't just quit going to your classes. Because I found out in the second year, second quarter, what I really wanted to do and I didn't do the right thing and didn't have anybody to ask, you know, what should I take, what courses should I take, so. That's a great piece of advice. Let me just make a quick plug for our Career Development Center. Um, if, if you do feel like you're not sure what you want to do, and or you're maybe in the wrong program, our Career Development Center is excellent and can work with you on um, finding what your passion is. And so um, if you're not sure, you can also speak with your academic advisor. They should be able to um, direct you to the Career Development Center or help you figure it out as well. But thank you, that's a great piece of advice. And Vicki? 
Um, well, yeah, I was 30 when I went back to school. So I think I would like to have had someone encourage me at a younger age to go back to school. I will say that when I did go to school, to respiratory school, I was the oldest person in my class. Mm -hmm. I was 30 years old and everyone else was 19, 20, 21. I did not let that stop me. They actually called me mama. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we became a really tight-knit little family. Um, we still talk to each other after all these years. So the I would say if, if you could go to school, there is support, financial support. There are people who will help you. So I wish someone would have told me that at a younger age because I did not know that. Yeah. I did not. Vicki, my son's best friend sat next to me in American history class. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't hear that. Her son's best friend sat next to her in one of her classes. So um, you probably were the oldest in your classes. I was. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I'm really curious to know what if you, each of you could tell us. What was the reaction from your family and friends when you told them that you were going to college? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, my family was ecstatic. Um, not only am I a first-generation college student, I'm also a first-generation high school graduate. Um, my parents actually graduated the eighth grade. So um, me going back to college was huge to them. So um, they were very happy. And of course my husband was very supportive. My kids, mm, <laughs> they were okay. Um, as long as I didn't have classes with them, they were fine with it. Um, but my, my whole family was ecstatic. They, they cheered me on and they, was, they kept in contact with me, asking me how I was doing and how much longer I had. And so they, they stayed involved. They were, and they cried on my graduation day, so. <laughs> Margaret, will you go next, please? Sure. Um, my family was, was happy that I went to school. Um, of course, as I keep saying, my husband was my greatest cheerleader. And as I move forward, my, my daughter is a running joke, she says, my mom is really serious about school. So she's getting ready to start school again. Oh my God, she's not gonna talk to you. She's not gonna <laughs> call you. <laughs> but they are ecstatic about me going to school. It's wonderful. You're a great role model for them. Thank Debbie, you. will you go next? Yeah, my parents were happy. Sorry about that, that's really loud. But my parents, my mom especially, finally like, you're not gonna be a secretary? No. But little does she, did she realize then, and I reminded her as I got older that a nurse is also a secretary, a teacher is also a secretary. So in essence, mom, I did fulfill that too. But for me, they were happy because they'd already said no, because my other option, I wanted to join the Peace Corps. And that was a flat out no. I was like, well, I want to go to college. So I'm going to go to college, and they were supportive. Can't. That's all I can think of. Will, will you go next? Sure. Um, I, I kind of had some mixed um, family members with some mixed feelings about it. Some were supportive, and I think some that maybe you feel like they didn't have the opportunity might have been a little resentful about it. And nothing, no one outright said anything out like way out of the way or anything but you know how it is sometimes when some some people like their jealousy can kind of impact them and and how they feel about people other people's successes or what they're doing so it was kind of mixed mixed for me and Vicki my family is not a very um, emotional family they uh, do not show like emotions very often unlike me <laughs> Um, but they, I think they worried about me going to school. Um, but while I was in school, my dad was diagnosed with emphysema and I was in school to be a respiratory therapist. So as school progressed, it, my family became much more supportive of my knowledge and the fact that I was in school because I actually did help with my dad a lot, so. That's wonderful. Did anybody, any of you feel as though you maybe lost some friends 
because you know sometimes where you hear stories about you, you hang out with your friends from high school or whatever, and then as Will said, some maybe think you've changed or you know you're, you're in a different crowd now, and sometimes they may feel like you you think you're better than them. Did any of you lose friends because you decided to go to college? You can. No. I don't think so. Okay. I didn't necessarily lose friends because I went to college. Um, we kind of, I would say, grew apart a little bit because I jumped right in and I didn't have time for social extras. Um, so I don't want to say that I lost the friends, but we're not as close as we were because I went to school full time and then priorities I, were different. my priorities yeah. were different and now I work full time. So we don't get to see each other as much, but I wouldn't say that I lost them. It's just the connection is a little bit less. Okay. If uh, each of you could talk a little bit about um, any of the campus resources that you had that you found most helpful, and then maybe we can piggyback this question into it. Were you involved in any clubs or organizations, and how did that help you? So it's resources on campus and then clubs and organizations. And Vicki, we're going to start with you. There was none. I was in no clubs and I had absolutely no idea what resources was available to me at where I went to school. Wow. So. <laughs> did you have an, an academic advisor? I did not. Wow. I did not. Um, I actually, um, Having been the program director here for respiratory therapy, I look at the students, our students here, and I'm like, you just don't realize how lucky you are. I had no one to guide me or help me. It was kind of like find your own way, you know, that like Debbie was talking about earlier, what classes do I take? There was a program director of the program, but not involved in the program. I, I knew nothing about financial aid, nothing. Uh, so, I, no, there was nothing. For me, Margaret. Um, for me, um, the resources that I used were um, the writing center, um, the tutoring um, center. Um, the clubs I were, was involved in was Trio and um, SGA. I am most supportive of Trio. I tell everyone about TRIO, being a first generation student and um, being exposed to some things that um, I wasn't exposed to when I was younger, like where we went to other campuses and universities and you know, being exposed to those things was helpful. And um, so being in TRIO, I also received tutoring there, um, which helped me a lot in some of my more difficult classes and being in SGA and just being able to um, support the college and the students' um, ideas and things that they wanted to bring forth um, was um, helpful for me. Um, and even with SGA, there was you know different types of things that we did on campus, so SGA, TRIO, and then tutoring um, and the Writing Center. So you talked about tutoring and TRIO. What other, other things do you think TRIO gave you? Um, it opened my eyes to um, things that I didn't see previously. As I said, we, we went to other campuses um, at colleges and universities. So, because my thought process in the very beginning was, I'm gonna you know, get my associate in medical office administration I'm going to find me a job. Um, and then all of a sudden it was like, hey, um, I could go to a university. And that exposure came from TRIO. Um, TRIO also um, showed, uh, gave us an opportunity to look at like different types of jobs and um, helped us with our skills, um, helped me with skills or you know just different points in um, TRIO that, you know, it opened up, um, I can't think of, uh, paying, it was like paying it forward. We worked with them to um, do things of that nature, but um, those are the things that TRIO helped me with. Debbie. 
That's amazing. I hope it doesn't sound bad, but I don't recall any resources, um, you know, for helping in that way at all, um, except for the fact that I was thankful there were work study. And there were work, I did work study at Appalachian because I paid for almost all of it and I worked all the way through. And when I came to school here for my ADN in nursing, I worked all the way through and I had work study. Um, so for me, the resource that was wonderful is that they had work study jobs available so it went around your schedules and worked with you. And that was, that was great. Um, at Appalachian, I was in the Collegiate Civitans group, but that was because a friend of mine from high school, he was getting the group together and they had just started it and this was in the middle 70s. And that was really good. It got you in touch with a lot of other people. And, um, but yeah, work study was awesome. Great, thank you. Well. Um. The academic advisors and the financial aid offices I thought were probably the most helpful resources, especially the um, VA school certifying officials because I was always using VA benefits or tuition assistance and stuff like that and they, they helped it make a much smoother process of going to school than if I tried to figure it out on my own. And then for um, clubs and organizations, when I did my MBA, there was an MBA association and um, they would meet and go out to different places and usually the, the business professors would be there too. So you get to talk to different people that were in the program at different levels, talk to professors about stuff outside the classroom and great like networking and educational like events to, to learn more and help get through the program. Thank you. Um, I wasn't in that many organizations or clubs. Um, like I said, I was older, I didn't have time. Between classes, I was doing laundry and getting groceries and stuff. I didn't have time for clubs. Um, but my, my um, resource that I used here the most was the ARC Pisces and Net Tutor. I'm a big component for Net Tutor tutoring service that you have on your Moodle shell. Um, I use them every week. <laughs> and, and that's an online tutor? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's available through your Moodle shell. Um, I love Net Tutor and Pisces. They, that got me through. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, the last question I have for everybody, and I think we've heard from Margaret about this already, but who was your greatest supporter or cheerleader? Margaret, do you want to say anything more about your husband or anybody else that was a cheerleader for you and why? Um, although my children did seem reluctant about me going to school, they were um, they were very supportive, and they acknowledged the fact that if I had to um, if I had homework to do or if I needed to study, they were respectful of that. So um, regardless, as if they were not super excited about um, she's going back to school, they did respect the fact that I, you know, needed to study. So in that form, they are cheerleaders because they did respect that time. So I did, do want to acknowledge that. That's so important because I know it would have been so challenging for you if your children and your husband were not supportive because, you know, they, I'm sure you felt pulled from one thing to the next. So that's really wonderful that they were so uh, Vicki? When I went back for my associate's degree, my biggest uh, cheerleader was my sister. Um, we were really close and she, she really encouraged me and she, she, she was my biggest cheerleader. Then I came to work at RCC and my biggest cheerleaders were RCC. And RCC is the reason I went back and got my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. Tell so, us a little bit more about that, like who were, was uh, it your faculty? My co-workers, co um, just my co-workers, the faculty here, um, you know, I was working part-time and then I became a full-time employee, but I was a lab assistant, I was a clinical assistant. Um, so my co-workers just encouraged me more education and I just really liked learning. And as a respiratory, as in healthcare, as every other field, we all continue to learn. 
So they just encouraged me and I actually got two bachelor's degrees and then went and got my master's and started on my PhD in my 60s. <laughs> uh, good for you. Well, lifelong learner. Uh, Will, will you please go next? Um, my wife's probably been the biggest supporter. She'll come proofread papers or read stuff for me to see if it makes sense after I write it. Because after you write so much, you're not sure if it even makes sense anymore. Um, my youngest kid probably is the biggest supporter of my children because I think she probably thinks that's what my occupation is because I've been in school since before she was born and still doing it. So I think she probably thinks that's just something that people do as part of their life is just keep going to school forever. So she's always been really supportive of it too. And we'll come in and look, check on what I'm doing when I'm working and stuff. You planted a very good seed there. Absolutely. She'll be thinking about that. Debbie? Um, my grandmother that lived in Florida was and when I was away from home in school in the 70s. And that was awesome because she always would send me a letter or she would occasionally send me a package. And that would be the only mail I ever received, unless you count junk mail. So it was nice looking forward to that. And then because I have other degrees too, my daughter, who I was single parent when I was getting my BS in, it took me a year to get my BS in, and I worked 40 hours a week. She's She's cool. She understood. When she went to bed at night, I studied. So I didn't ever interrupt time with her. And then um, my husband of 34 years and daughter, they are the ones that have really supported me. Going back to school 30 some years ago, they both forced me to go to graduation after I finished graduate school. Uh, I was tired. I'd worked a 12 hour night shift. I was like, I'm tired. They're like, no. You won't do this again. You need to go to your own graduation. So I'm glad I did. But they've been very supportive all the way. And Grace? I gotta say my husband. Yeah. My husband was pretty incredible during my whole education. Um, there was lots of times that, you know, I would tell him, you know, I need to get a job. Like, I can put this on the back burner. We, I need to get a job, you know. And he was like, no. <laughs> No, he said you're gonna you're gonna finish this, um, and if it was tough, he would help me study. And I, I have to say, he was probably my number one cheerleader, and he still is. It doesn't matter what I'm doing; he's my number one cheerleader. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, and now is the time where I'd love to open it up for any questions in the audience, um, and we do have a mic, I believe, that we could uh, bring. Along, if any, but raise your hand if you have any questions, and please don't leave yet because we do have a raffle at the end of this uh, event. So yes, uh, I love this panel discussion. Uh, I actually am a first. Well, my brother and I are first generation. We're one year apart, and so we started college. He started college. I started the next year. Um, and I was in the Elbow Bound program at the University of Georgia, uh, and I benefited from that as well. And I just think this is a great program, the TRIO, any of these services. I, the whole time, my daughter and my son, they're both in college right now. I was looking for all these uh, resources and scholarships and stuff. I was just a, like the scholarship guru. It was so many benefits out here for first generation. I was like, why is my child not a first generation? Why is she, because I miss these scholarships. So I wish we would do that more. Um, I even thought for a while I wasn't really a first generation because my daddy went back to a community college or a technical university, it was technical school then. Uh, but I wanted to also mention that, you know, we need to let students know that if your, their parent did not graduate from, from a four-year institution, they're con still considered a first generation. So we, there's misconcepts out there that I had not knowing that I was really a first generation. I passed over a lot of uh, opportunities that could have been available to me as a first generation. Uh, so we need to promote that to our students that, you know, still if, you know, if, you're, if your parent did not graduate from a four-year institution, you can still benefit from all of these great things. And uh, you, can, 
can go great places. Just really encouraged about all of us just stepping out. My parents uh, encouraged us. They, they said we didn't get a chance to go. Uh, so you guys are going. So I didn't have that, you know, and I was like, I don't know if I can make it because I was really not focused at that time. You know, I was still having a lot of fun. So, um, so you know, they said, you're going to get focused and get your education because that was a big thing for them. They felt like we should do that. So thank you for bringing this forth. Uh, I think it's, it's got to be other ways that we can uh, promote this Crown Star campus to make sure that our students know that these opportunities are available. Thank you, Glenn. Any other questions? We have one behind you here. So you had like all of these external things, your families, um, jobs, all of that. How did you go about planning your day-to-day -day schedule so that you could make sure you were able to uh, be successful in your classes? How did you get organized? Pro you have a choice. Time management, prioritizing, and as I think many of us have said on, on the panel that, and I've never mentioned I had a child. I had a child while I was in college the entire time. I was a single mom. Um, you wait till they go to bed and you do your homework. And yep. You do laundry in between cl your classes and Football you just games. you just make it work. You do, you, it's just got to be there. You, you want it and you're going to make it work. Yep. Did you have Child care was family taking care of your child? Family. Uh -huh. Sunday was my day. Sunday was my schoolwork day. Everybody knew to leave me alone on Sundays. <laughs> Been for yourself, y'all old enough. So Sunday, I just made Sunday my day. Sunday I'd get up, make my coffee, start working. So that that's how I had to do it. I just had to pick a day. Okay. My daughter went to school with me. Huh? So I was fortunate even at her being four years old at a and State, they let my daughter come to classes with me. So she was learning how to use a microscope in botany. She could sit really quiet and still when there's a lecture going on and, and you know, I had educational courses, but they were, they were awesome. Plus I worked 40 hours a week at the hospital, so I, and my head nurse is still alive. But Jean May was my head nurse. She worked with my schedule. So I have worked every schedule except 3P to 3AM that the hospital offers because they always worked with me That's so nice. I could go to school, which was cool. Now is your daughter in the medical field today? She thought she wanted to be, but my daughter is actually a teacher. <laughs> She, she got her degree, um, she went to start here and then went to UNCG and has her degree in science and she has her master's degree in education and she paid for all of it by herself, except for just one year. Margaret? I think that as you, um, as you make your schedule, you have to figure out um, when things are due and when um, you kind of figure out when you need to study, when, and you see when your assignments are due, so you can you break that time up. Even if you're working, you um, have to. You can take your lunch, and when you take your lunch, you have to, sometimes you just have to study. You have to do homework. Um, if your assignments are due on Saturday, then you know that you need whatever day that the assignment comes out. You need to start. If you have a discussion question, you maybe need to start that immediately. Read about that, you know, submit it, however that goes. But um, you kind of have to look at your look at your schedule, your work schedule, school schedule, home schedule, and then you just have to break that up. And sometimes it requires you to do your work at home. Yes, your school work at home, but you have to remember to take a break do something else and then come back to your work because if you don't you think you'll never get anything done so sometimes you have to break things up into pieces is i guess the best way to say that um, but you still have a schedule there's still a schedule but you still have to break things up into pieces and so you can be successful with completing it so they're not overwhelming yes yeah. well 
Um, pretty much like she's just saying, breaking it up into pieces, like if you got time during lunch, work on some stuff, in the evenings work on stuff, in the mornings work on stuff. Um, I like having background noise, so I have I can sit in the living room and have the TV on and kids be sitting with the kids watching TV and be reading stuff and working on stuff. So I know that don't work for everybody, but I'm fortunate that it does for me because I don't I don't feel like I'm missing as much of life going on in the house if I'm if I'm able to sit in the same room with them and work on papers or read. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one in the back here. Good afternoon. Um, I just have one question for the whole panel. Um, prior to today, how many of you? How many of you by show of hands knew that there was a national first generation day? I did. Thank you. Now, I believe, Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, but did it start in 2017? I'm not sure what it's the first Yeah, time. I was trying to look that up, but, um, so it's only been around for a short time, but um, I, I think it's, I don't know if we've celebrated it in the past here, but it should be a new tradition that we have. And um, I do want to thank you all for attending today's presentation. Again, we're going to get this online somewhere. Um, to So for folks who could not make it at this time today, they are still able to watch the panel. And thank you, each and every one of you, so much for your inspiring stories, and I'm sure Every day, you're inspiring people that you know and maybe some people that you don't really know, um, but that you know, have heard your story and to really just never give up. You know, the grit and resilience that you need to finish um, is really quite amazing. So thank you so much for being here today and sharing your stories. And Daniel, do you want to come up for our raffle? I just, while he's coming up, I want to plug one more time our TRIO Student Support Services that we have on campus here. Uh, it's federally funded. It's right down the hall in the ADT building here, and um, we would love for you to stop by and talk to you about the different services. Uh, we have grant aid money, and um, we do go out to different colleges, four-year schools to uh, introduce you to the different types of uh, programs and services at four-year institutions. It's really good to go out and walk on the campuses or, you know, at different colleges and uh, see if you feel like that's where you belong. And so TRIO gives you that opportunity if you are, um, if you meet some of the eligibility requirements. So, Daniel, I will let you take over. Uh, good morning. So we had a raffle for our students. Um, so if you're one of the students, please pull out your ticket and we'll pull, call a number. Oh, sure. And then the winner is number 4919564. All right, I'll meet you in the back. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I know this week, I think it's been a pretty good week so, you know, so far for our first gen students. Um, this is, yes, so I think it's been the first week that we've celebrated our first generation students um, and I know that I've paired with TRIO and I think we're going to continue this and I hope it continues to grow because this is a great week. Um, I myself, as most people were talking about, as I was sending out emails to figure out who the panel members would be, I didn't even know it, but I was first generation. Um, and you know, now that we're talking about it and talking about it more, starting to reflect, you know, that really means a lot, and you know, we don't realize how many students don't even know it as well. Um, so that's huge, and we can continue to voice that. It's really great for our students to see this stuff. Um, so yeah, I'll meet the student in the back. Thank you. And we also have the guest speaker coming this afternoon for the student empowerment event. So please join us this afternoon as well, and thank you. <laughs>